Hello everyone, this video is to replace uh, the Reproductive System Part 1 video that has been obliterated from YouTube for some reason. So uh, it's only a few slides long before we get to Repro Part 2, which is about spermatogenesis and male reproductive function, but in the interest of continuity, we got to make sure that we do this first part. So away we go. So let's see here that. So the first couple of slides on this PowerPoint are about the development of the reproductive system, which is to say, uh, how do you arrive at having a penis, scrotum, and testes, or having a vagina, uterus, and ovaries? So the first and perhaps uh, very most important piece of this set of information is the following. I'm sorry, I'm just switching slides here. I hate writing with the red ink, it stresses me out. And that is just the idea that everyone starts with the same stuff. So the genital tubercle, which is the name for uh, this set of structures, they've been falsely colored so you can see what structures end up with which fully developed ones. Um, this is a mass of tissue that really could go either way. And you can actually see that reflected in the name for uh, certain things, like the labioscrotal swelling. So the swelling, uh, this precursor tissue, is capable of differentiating either into the labia or into the scrotum, depending on developmental trajectory. So at about five weeks, everybody starts out with the same material. Between five and ten weeks, depending on the presence of a Y chromosome or not, you get either the development of the glands area towards the glands penis, which is the end of the penis, or the glands area transforms into the glands of the clitoris, which is the corresponding structure. As you can see, um, there are both urethral and labioscrotal swellings and folds for both, and there is a perineum and the anus. So at this point, um, even though differentiation has begun, uh, we still have two structures that look relatively similar. Um, so to give you a quick rundown on why this happens, So XY, and I'm, I'm sorry about this weird spiky thing, it's something that PowerPoint's pen function does. It drives me nuts. So on the Y chromosome, there is a gene called SRY, which stands for sex determining region of the Y chromosome. SRY codes for uh, a protein called TDF, which is testis determining factor. So this happens if there is a Y chromosome present. If not, so if the individual's sex chromosomes look like this or look like this, where there is only one X and not another one, in both of these situations, you get uh, physiologically female development. So this means that female development, and I'm, I'm saying female on terms of the hormonal and reproductive structures that develop. So the, the discussions we're having here, I want to be very clear, have nothing to do with gender identity. They have everything to do with the physiology of reproductive structures. So either XX or XO is the uh, default setting so even if you don't have a Y chromosome and you only have one X, you still get female reproductive development. Um, the only time when you get male reproductive development is if there's a Y chromosome present. So near birth, these structures have continued to develop and you can see that the colors have been maintained so that you can see which ending structures begin from which precursor materials at the top. Um, so the urethral folds, for example, in female development become the labia minora 
plural. There's one labium minus per side. And in male development, they become this seam on the bottom of the penis and scrotum called the penile rafe, R-A-P-H-E. In male development, the labioscrotal swelling and fold becomes the scrotum, and in female development becomes the labia majora. The glands area becomes the glands clitoris in the female development trajectory and the glands penis in the male. So everybody starts out with the same material as far as external genitalia, um, which means that the vulva, which is the name for the outer genitalia in female development, and the penis and scrotum are what are called homologous structures, meaning that they are developmentally derived from the same starting material. It is only hormonal and developmental regulation, which makes them appear different in a fully developed human. So that brings me to homologous structures in general. This is just a summary slide saying everything's derived from the genital tubercle. And if we want to summarize, for those of you who like table style organization, here's that penile wraith I mentioned. Um, you can see that there is great homology between male external genitalia and female external genitalia. So all they, although they may appear different and socially and culturally we think of them as being different, everybody starts with the same stuff. And um, I would be remiss as a biologist if I didn't acknowledge the existence of intersex individuals. Um, intersex individuals are folks for whom uh, their external genitalia development ends up somewhere in the middle. So somewhere between these two structures. So I'm going to draw a little arrow here. So intersex means exactly what it sounds like between the classically recognized sexes. So why am I mentioning this at all? Well, um, intersex individuals exist in normal populations, and they're about as common as redheaded people. And they're also about as common in normal populations as people who identify as Jewish. So I'm not drawing a con uh, comparison between these groups other than to say uh, they have frequency in common. My point here is we are used to encountering redheaded people and people who are Jewish in our day-to-day -day lives because they make up a portion of our population. They are part of our community. Intersex individuals are about as frequent as those folks. So they're part of our community biologically and they deserve to be acknowledged. So uh, let me erase this so you can see the rest of what's on the slide. So the rest of these terms won't probably mean much to you yet because we haven't gone through the glandular system of the reproduction or the glandular structures of the reproductive system. Um, but it's important to note that the homology continues with physiology. Uh, so for example, we're going to talk in pretty great detail about how the penis achieves an erection. Clitorises achieve erection as well. So the homology in structure translates into homology in function. So uh, this is a dissection. And these are two plates from the Netter's Atlas showing you uh, the glands penis over here and the glands clitoris over here. Um, and then the vestibular bulbs are homologous to the corpora cavernosa, the glands, and to some extent the crew of the clitoris is homologous, homologous excuse me, to the glands penis. Okay, so that was external genitalia structures. We still haven't talked about the ovaries and the testes, um, 
and the uterus and the fallopian tubes. So just like the genital tubercle being sort of a universal starter structure, the gonads have a universal starter structure too. So everybody in about the same stage, five to six week embryo, starts out with just gonads. So the gonad is the endocrine structure that also produces gametes, so sex cells. Notice that at five to six weeks, we just call them gonads. We're not calling them ovaries or testes yet. That's because they're not different. So if you are an XX individual or an XY individual, doesn't matter. This is what you start out with. So you have a pair of protogonads, so gonadal tissue that has yet to quote unquote decide whether it wants to be a testis or an ovary. And along with each of those protogonads, you have two ducts. So there is the Mullerian duct called the paramesonephric and the Wolfian duct, which is called the mesonephric. So um, nephric or nephros refers to the kidney and that's because the development of the urinary system and the development of the reproductive system are linked. So to give you an example of that that might be more relatable, if you are a male in middle to later middle age and you begin to experience difficulty urinating, you're going to go see a urologist and the urologist is going to ask you questions about and examine your prostate. The prostate is officially a reproductive structure, but the prostate surrounds the internal parts of the urethra which exit through the penis. So because prostate cancer is a very common but fortunately very curable kind of cancer, um, a urologist spends a lot of their time thinking about the relationship between the prostate, a repro structure, and its effect on the urethra and the ability to pass urine, which is urinary function. So that's an example of the, the real world consequence between, or of the relationship between the gonads and the urinary system. More on urinary system later. Okay, so if you have a Y chromosome and testis determining factor, that causes the transformation of the gonads into testes and the transformation and development of the Wolfian duct. Uh, Wolfian here refers to the name of the person who discovered these. It turns out if you find something, you get to name it after yourself. So Wolfian, Dr. Wolf. Um, so you get development of the Wolfian ducts and then degeneration of the Malarian ducts. If there is, so I'm gonna draw the gametic sex on each side. If there is either two X chromosomes or one, this is the setting that develops. So you get the differentiation into ovaries and you get the development of the Mullerian ducts and the degradation of the Wolfian ducts. So this is how this works. So TDF does this and lack of TDF does this. So it's not like there's a special ovary determining factor that doesn't exist. It's just in the absence of TDF, ovaries develop. So that's why I call it the quote unquote default setting. It's what happens if there is no Y chromosome. Okay, so that's where the gonads come from. One quick developmental fact before we move on is a caveat. In addition to testing testes determining factor, there is another gene involved with sex determination, um, which is called DMRT1. That's a terrible one. You get the idea. Um, DMRT1 must be continually expressed. So remember from when biology 160 gene expression means the transformation of DNA into a messenger RNA and the translation of that messenger RNA into a protein. So rates of gene expression just say how often is that occurring for a particular gene. So if DMRT1 is not constantly expressed, let 
There's that spike again. So what I wrote there is constant expression is required for testis maintenance, meaning in order for the testes to stay testes and not convert into ovarian tissue, you have to have constant expression of DMRT1. Um, so in exper experiments with mice, for example, uh, if you knock out DMRT1 in genetically and physiologically male mice, their testes end up reverting to a ovarian state. So it's not only this, it's also this. Um, there's an excellent podcast on all of these developmental processes from Radiolab called Gonads. So if you're curious to learn more about this stuff, because it's really interesting, um, I recommend you go there. So I'm just going to move on because I've already explained all this stuff. Um, so this is just what things look like at birth. So you just basically have tiny versions of all of the structures that one will have as an adult. So one feature that I didn't mention is what causes the degeneration of the malarian ducts uh, in the presence of TDF. The other thing that I didn't mention is the nurse cells in the testes. So uh, the nurse cells in the testes are cells which promote the development of sperm. And another thing that they do is secrete a variety of hormones. So they're part of the endocrine function of the testis. And one thing they secrete is called malarian inhibiting factor which causes those female reproductive tracts to, de uh, to degenerate. So here is a little bit more about SRY. So SRY is up here. It's in this little tip region. Um, and notice also the Y chromosome is a lot shorter than the X, meaning Compared with the X, and uh, here the, the black bars mean a coding region, the Y chromosome is relatively gene poor. So it doesn't have a whole lot of genes on it. Um, and this is actually good because it means that having one X chromosome is survivable. Um, it's called Turner syndrome. So Turner syndrome individuals have one X chromosome and no other X or Y. And that's because there aren't a whole lot of genes on the Y chromosome. So um, as far as survivability goes, you can get away with not having one. The X chromosome, not so much. There's a bunch of important genes on there and you need at least one. Okay, so as far as structures are concerned, the gonads, as I mentioned, are structures that produce both gametes sex cells, so sperm and eggs, and also hormones, mostly steroid hormones, so androgens and estrogens. So that's gonads. The duct system is the system by which gametes are conveyed, so um, the seminiferous tubules leading into the epididymis, leading into the vas deferens, and through the penis for male reproduction, and the fallopian tubes, uterus, cervix, and vagina for the female. Um, and we also have organs like the uterus and like the prostate and others. Um, and finally, external genitalia, as I discussed the development of previously. So this isn't something that I'm going to test you on. However, it is a developmental process that has significance clinically. And so I want to mention it to you just so that you're aware. Um, the spermatic cord, which is a group of tubes that lead from the scrotum uh, out of the scrotum, um, actually passes through the anterior body wall. So if you look up here, 
you'll see here's the developing kidneys and here's the gonads. That's the, that link between the urinary system and the reproductive system. Um, the testes, as they develop, actually descend or move downward. And they're supposed to, um, so here's, you know, two months, three months. This happens after birth. They're, I mean, excuse, excuse me, before birth, leading up to birth. They're supposed to descend. So here's at birth, and the penis has been removed so you can see the testes. So what's supposed to happen is that the testes are supposed to crawl down the posterior body wall and then go out through the inguinal canal and into the scrotum. If that does not occur, uh, we get a condition called cryptorchidism. So crypt means hidden and orchid is not a flower, it actually means testis. So the term orchid to describe a plant was borrowed from the Latin term for testis. There's a little bit of etymology for you. So crypt cryptorchidism is the phenomenon wherein developmentally the testes fail to descend into the scrotum. And unfortunately that often results in infertility and that is because the testes have to be in the scrotum uh, so that they are maintained at a lower body temperature than the rest of the body because sperm are very sensitive to temperature and they will die if they are too hot. So male reproductive anatomy, this is the gross anatomy. So here we have a sagittal pelvis. Um, you can see that down here in the scrotum, this is where sperm are born. So in order to get out, a sperm needs to travel from here through all the tubes here and then up through the inguinal canal over the bladder. So that's the vas or ductus deferens. Here, here's the seminal vesicle um, and the prostate, which we'll discuss in detail later. Um, but really, sperm has a long way to go, and it has to kind of do this loop-de-loop -loop to get out. So um, the health and well-being of all of these reproductive passages is contingent upon the health and well-being of all of the structures they pass through. So this is part of male reproductive and urinary health. So I'm not going to spend time reading this chart to you because I know you, my students, are more than smart enough to figure this out for yourselves. And also we're, we're gonna be revisiting a lot of these structures like the bulbal urethral gland and the ejaculatory duct um, later when we discuss the process of emission and ejaculation. So for now, uh, look at this sagittal pelvis, memorize its structures and be able to know them for when I talk about the physiology of them later. So with regard to the external anatomy absent the penis, I mentioned the sperm has a long way to go. Um, the scrotum is not simply a sac of skin. It has muscles in it, including the cremaster muscle, which wraps around each testis, but also around the spermatic cord. So the spermatic cord is the name for a group of tubes. And that group of tubes includes the ductus deferens, but also the deferential and testicular arteries, so two different arteries, and the veins of the pampiniform plexus. So the spermatic cord is a name for a group of tubes that are wrapped in the cremaster muscle. The cremaster muscle will raise and lower the testes according to temperature keeping the testes and the sperm being produced inside at the correct uh, temperature for optimal survival and fertility. So it contracts reflectively, reflexively. Although the cremaster muscle is technically a skeletal muscle, it is governed by reflexes, so not entirely voluntary. Um, and this is stimulated by sexual arousal, reduced testicular temperature, so it moves the testes closer to the body if they're cold, uh, and also reflexive contraction if the inside of the thigh is touched, so it moves the testes away from the inner thigh. So the primary function of the scrotum is to house the testes 
and regulate testicular temperature. The other muscle I mentioned is the dartos muscle, and this is right under the scrotal skin. So this one also contracts and really it changes the surface, uh, surface area of the testes. So if it contracts, it causes the scrotum to appear sort of shriveled and wrinkly, and if it's relaxed, the scrotal skin is more unfurled. Um, so this is going to work with the cremaster muscle to make sure that the testes are maintained at a temperature that's appropriate for spermatogenesis. So each testis, that's singular, plural is testes, but this male pelvis is blocking that, so let's add it. Uh, they're also called testicles. So what the testis is, is basically a egg or ellipsoid shaped mass of wadded up tubes. So those tubes are called the seminiferous tubules. Um, there's about 800 for a testis and each one is about 32 inches long. So this provides a lot of surface area for spermatogenesis in a very small package. So spermatogenesis is the production of sperm cells. And in addition to the developing sperm cells, and we'll go through everything in this picture later, so stay tuned for that, um, there are interstitial cells, which are between the tubes. And these are also called Leydig cells. These produce androgens, primarily testosterone. The nurse cells are found inside of here, and really they're arranged like this. And there's many, many, many of them along the tubes, and the sperm develop between them, kind of like flowers pressed between pages of a book. Um, so these help to regulate spermatogenesis, uh, so helping the developing sperm towards their final goal of becoming a fully functional swimming spermatozoan. Spermatogonia are the stem cells. So um, interesting feature of male reproductive biology versus female. Each time one of these divides, undergoing mitosis, which means that the result of this division is diploid, the two daughter cells are one spermatogonium, And then one primary spermatocyte. So what this means is in males, there's a constant supply of spermatogonia, which are stem cells, which means that um, it's possible to produce sperm from puberty until death. So the reproductive window is very large. Not the same with female reproductive de development, and we'll talk more about that later. So spermatogonia do not undergo mitosis, or excuse me, do not undergo meiosis, they undergo mitosis. Meiosis processes begin with the primary spermatocyte. So they undergo meiosis one to become a secondary spermatocyte, and those undergo meiosis two, see here, and that turns into spermatids, which are small cells closer to the lumen of the seminiferous tubule, and then spermatids undergo a process called spermiogenesis, which is they go from round shaped to a shape that looks like this. So spermiogenesis is not the same thing as spermatogenesis. Spermiogenesis is a shape change uh, to go from a ball shaped cell to a cell that is capable of swimming. So front to back, spermatogenesis is a nine week process, but because it's always occurring from puberty on, um, a person with testes always has sperm being produced or at some part or at some stage in this process. So mitosis, which is undergone by spermatogonia, produces diploid daughter cells, one of those daughter cells will become a primary spermatocyte, the other one is going to stay over here and become a spermatogonium. 
and then meiosis, which is gamete production. So this cuts the number of chromosomes in half, and we call these gamete haploid. Uh, one thing to avoid is calling anything a haploid. So I see a lot of things uh, in student answers like stuff like this. I'm putting quotes around it. Produces haploids. Okay. Haploid what? Haploid is an adjective. It describes a cell as having half the DNA of a somatic cell. Haploids means nothing. It's not a word. Um, so you need to not use this and instead say haploid gametes. So haploid eggs, haploid sperm. Spermiogenesis is, as I mentioned, the transformation of spermatids into spermatozoa. And spermiation is when the nurse cell lets go of these spermatids and releases them into the lumen such that they are now spermatozoa. So they are fully formed, they are not stuck to anything, they are capable of being released and moving on to the next step. All right, and this is the slide where reproductive system part two kicks off. So this is where I will end. So thank you for your attention, and I will see you in the next video, which is, of course, reproduction part two, where we talk about spermatogenesis in a lot more detail. Until next